so so down here in uh, in the tail of Texas, uh, it's uh, basically like little Mexico. There's uh, you know uh, Caucasians are few and far between. Uh, there are many uh, cute little abuelitas and abuelitos, and uh, just the whole. Uh, it's basically like uh, you know it's like Mexico where uh, everybody speaks English. There's also a big shout out to Taco Palenque. Want to give a big. Uh, Give them uh, the notoriety, one of the uh, the first and foremost uh, chain taquerias uh, in the United States. And uh, you know, just uh, scattered among the general uh, commercial and retail refuse, there's a uh, little bits of habitat left, uh, a type of habitat uh, known as a tamalipin thorn scrub, uh, which is home to many uh, rare you know, plants that occur nowhere else in the continental United States, uh, such as the Lofafra williamsii. At a peyote, and you can see that the mesquite here just gets absolutely enormous. This is all uh, prosopis, it's all uh, mesquite. Many different kinds of euphorbiaceae, fabaceae, and uh, uh, some of the, the most uh, diversity among the ground dwelling cactus that you could see in any one region. And here you go, here's some of the habitat. You can see it's just these uh, undulating plains where everything is basically spiny and uh, covered in very short hairs, or short leaves, if anything. Here's Leucophyllum protessens. It has a rain there in a while. Here's a species of Castilla. Same family as Atlantis right there. Here's another species of Castilla photosynthesizing through its stems and then you can see it's got a couple leaves down here a couple residual tiny leaves but uh, you know a lot of stuff does this too it's it just you see this convergence evolutionary convergence unrelated plants evolving the same method of coping with uh, intense drought and uh, the selective pressures uh, of uh, being the only green thing in a uh, hot and dry environment you know you're gonna get there's gonna be a lot of pressure for things to eat you so a way to cope with that of course is just to become very unfriendly to anything that might want to touch you and so that's why I got multiple different species you know say the Castilla which is in Cimarubaceae and then you got Zizyphus which is in Ramnaceae and uh, you know unrelated plants all doing the same thing just getting really spiny oh look here's a species of Corophanta and then of course you have this whole understory of uh, everything from uh, peyote to corophanta to a uh, philocactus over here. Basically just, uh, you know, basically an under canopy of all these uh, different uh, small cacti growing here. You know, and this is one of the cases where I'm actually thankful that a lot of the land here uh, in Texas is private because it really reduces the chances of some, uh, you know, say druggy asshole uh, going out to just poach a bunch of peyote wholesale uh, because, you know, the threat is still there that you'll get shot for being on someone else's land. Uh, this plant right here, oh look, it's a cylindro puncha. This just looks like a Christmas cactus when they got their fruits on them. They're like these little r bright red fruits. This is a species that's pretty interesting. This is in a sunflower family. It's a succulent member of the sunflower family. This is Varia Texana. Looks like Varilla. But of course, knowing that two L's in Spanish translate to a Y sound, it's Varia. Varia Texana. And it seems to like the very salty soils. There's only two species in a genus, Varia uh, one's uh, Mexicana and the other's Texana. Uh, Texana is the only one I've ever seen in person, but uh, it does. It likes these these kind of salty pebble plains. The, the the Spanish name for this is Saladillo, because it, uh, like I said, it likes that salty soil. Oh, here's a species of Echinocereus. It's not doing too well. It's kind of on its last legs there. Just completely dry. Again, they have not gotten rain for a long time. And all this is just former floodplain of the Rio Grande, you know, uh, over the last, uh, you know, 500,000 years, say. All these 
pebbles are just rounded and tumbled, etc., by uh, being in the river. This is basically just the uh, undulating former floodplain of the Rio Grande. You know that the, maybe you've heard of the the new legume phylogeny working group. You know, real decent organization. They just they've been uh, doing some some work on the legumes, swapping them around. You know, swapping shit around. Figuring out, because legumes are huge. It's a huge family for basically. You got 20,000 species in it. So they need some work. You know, they did the molecular work in there looking at the, the, the molecular phylogenetics to see how recently one species diverged from another, one tribe diverged from another, one subfamily diverged from another, and whatever this shit. I think this is Corophantha macromeris. You can see that right there. See the nipples? You see the nipples over there? The tubercles? Fabaceae is a wonderful family. It really is. You know, everything from uh, from oils and foods to fibers and goddamn nitrogen fixing, uh, everything is. So many plants are in the pea family, the legume family. So that's what the new, phylog the new legume phylogeny did. You know, they gave me one of their business cards with some of the magnets and shit. You know, I got a magnet on my fridge. They gave me a, there was actually a, they a, a, a 10 burrito discount card that the new legume phylogeny group sponsors. I'm completely full of shit. I'm just pulling your leg. Anyway, let's see what else is uh, what else is out here. Oh yeah, I love this habitat. I like the open habitats. I don't like the the dark shady forests and shit so much with all the bugs. I like it hot and dry, you know. And it's hot. It's hot. But of course, if you come here in the winter, uh, oh look, there's a little snail out there. What's he doing? What is this guy doing? Oh, he's 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 stuck in there. He doesn't want me to pull him off. I better leave him alone. You know, but you come here in January, it's completely different, you know? It's, of course, colder, and then, of course, there's a lot more moisture in the atmosphere and uh, on the ground as well, and it's super muddy. And not only that, but there's, you know, cyanobacteria, there's slime, slimy cyanobacterial films on the ground and algae. Everything comes to life. The ground is green. There's ground lichen everywhere. And then, uh, of course, uh, like I said, there's just a little cute species of peyote. And that species, individual of peyote, just hanging out uh, beneath this uh, acacia rigidula. Again, vicellia rigidula. You can see he's just, he's kind of having a hard time right there. You know? And by the way, if any of you come out here and poach this, I'll kick you all in the dick. Okay? And if you don't have a dick, I'll kick you in the figurative dick, all right? You gotta be a sick fuck to come out here and poach, all right? And I will find you. And if I don't find you, I know people who will, okay? Look at this varia. You know, I mean, you're gonna come, you're gonna come take a plant that's taken 20 years to get the size of a quarter, so you can get a, a two, a, you know, a, a two day high, puke your guts out, and you know, half of you probably won't even learn nothing about yourself that's too insightful anyway. Maybe some of you will, but, uh, you know, get it sustainably. Get it from the Payateros or something if you're trying to do that. But uh, me personally, I don't even feel any need to. All right, let's see if we can find uh, some more specimens of that wonderful Lofafra. Okay, so so there you go. There's, uh, you know, aside from uh, mescaline, which is, of course, an alkaloid uh, that, you know, is, is going to make a rabbit puke, I don't think it's going to be very pleasant. Uh, they also have the ability, the Lofafras do, to just completely hide. And these are little guys. You know, I've seen them where they get the size of a grapefruit. And, it, you know, each mass is about 20 different grapefruits on it. You know, and that's, again, it's a benefit of, that's a benefit of some of the, uh, the fact that everything's privately owned here. Is that just the, the de facto conservation. So there's, a, there's one little guy. He's small. And it is dry as a bone. Again, it is as dry as a bone out here. Anyway, that was that was Border Patrol. Just wonder what we're doing. This is a we're actually on private land. Got permission to be here, and uh, our friend who actually owns this property uh, is pretty well armed. He's a friendly guy. He's uh, somewhat well known in the region. Uh, regardless, let's take a look at this uh, grandpa specimen you got here. Beautiful specimen of Lofafra. Beautiful Lofafra Williamsii. Williamsii. Could you say Williamsii? I guess so. You can see that thick uh, powdery cuticle he's got on there. That thick powdery epidermis. You know, and again, bl that blue color just to reduce uh, the effect of the intense heat. 
you know, and of course out here, they're just, they want to minimize their exposure. I mean, they're still pretty exposed, but you know, just commonly growing beneath the, uh, whatever other uh, shrubs they can find, you know, whether it's a, a Lyceum, a, a Leucospermum, Castilla, a species of uh, Vichelia, you know, or a Cobralina, any of these. All those plants generally kind of tend to look the same, especially if you're not in the botany. And that again is that convergent evolution that uh, just the same selective pressures being put on a plant growing in a hot and dry area produce the same morphological response. You know, photosynthetic stems, toxic uh, secondary chemistry to discourage herbivory, small leaves, sometimes no leaves at all, and of course a blue color, sometimes you get some hairs. The glaucous color, that blue color, really reduces uh, reduces the effects of the heat. You know, whether it's just the, the temperature of the tissue, how hot stuff gets in the sun, or uh, how, how well it reflects, ultraviolet light, etc. Well, it's nice and kind of serious. It's a pretty wonderful habitat down here, and there's not that much left, you know? A lot has been turned into agriculture. A lot has been plowed under, you know, because people just, uh, I guess it's a thing human beings do where they see if something doesn't directly benefit them, then there's no point in keeping it around. Again, just the generally depauperate fucking worldview kind of makes me want to throw up. The more kind of serious. Here you get the... Get a little bit more of this same kind of thing going on. It's this wonderful, beneath the canopy of mesquite, prosopis, you just get this, uh, this, you know, like I said, light canopy where all these cacti can grow and do their thing. And again, you come here in January, the ground's moist, there's lichen on everything, uh, there's cyanobacteria, the species of cyanobacteria is Nostoc. Look that one up, that's a pretty weird one. Just looks like a green snotty film that occurs in little yay sized clumps, uh, you know, on the ground, basically, throughout the area. There's another cool species called the Echinocereus uh, poselgeri that grows around here, but I don't even think I'd be able to find it. It doesn't, it just looks like a white stick. You know, it looks like, like this. See how this is covered in lichen and it's kind of giving it that, uh, that white color, the bark here? That is lichen, by the way. That's not the that's not the natural color of his bark. That's what a kind of serious poselgeri looks like. But then, of course, you know when it blooms, it's got these just massive pink flowers. Well, prickly pears over there. That looks fun to walk through. And there you go. There's some of that uh, that lichen I was telling you about. Just kind of looks like dog shit now, or like someone threw up their beans and rice. <clears throat> beans and rice are a lovely thing to vomit up, by the way. Very illustrious when you splatter them on the pavement for everybody to see later on. Anyway, uh, so this is dormant right now, but of course, uh, in the winter, once they get a little bit of rain or fog, it just comes back to life, starts photosynthesizing. Again, it's a symbiosis between uh, an algae and a fungus, and sometimes you get a yeast in there, too. Oh, this guy didn't make it, huh? Had a kind of serious... Wah, wah. Just a little skeleton left, that's it. Varia's looking... Well, actually, you know what? The Varia looks like shit, too. Everything kind of looks like shit here, but uh, you know that's just that's just summer in a Chihuahua desert. I do like I do like a, a dry cow patty. I do like it. It reminds me, you know, it's sentimental to me, dry dried cow shit, because it reminds me of being a kid. When I was a kid, I got I was kind of bad, you know. Mostly avoided drugs, just caused a lot of trouble, vandalism, uh, juvenile mischief, and whatnot. And I got sent away to uh, uh, an outward bound program. I actually was mandated by the courts, and so, uh, you know, a bunch of kids got sent there by the courts, and, uh, you know, we used to find, it was somewhere in Utah, we used to find these little, uh, basically just huge piles of dried cow shit, and then we'd wing them at each other, you know, uh, sometimes hard enough to, that it felt like getting pelted uh, with a brick, it, you know, overall pleasant memories for me, we'd be laughing our asses off, rolling around, throwing dried cow feces at each other, uh, you know, and uh, it was just, uh, you know, up at like 6,000 feet elevation on a mountain. Very, very lovely childhood memories. It's a nice sunset, too, huh? Look at that. It's so dry that the goddamn acacia 
has uh, folded its leaves up. You know, it's basically a closed up shop and said, uh, you know what, fuck it, I'm not going to even bother photosynthesizing right now. Actually, it might be photosynthesizing now, but just in an effort to reduce moisture loss, uh, they folded those those pinnate leaves up. It's called being pinnate. When you have one central stem, a central rachis, and on either side you got little leaflets, which of course many of the Fabaceae do. And you could be twice pinnate, thrice pinnate, which means you got one rachis going up, then another rachis coming this way, and then another rachis coming off that rachis, etc. You get the idea. Oh, we got all that Texana, that Varia Texana. There's tons of that little succulent, succulent Asteraceae. Succulent aster. I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know what's wrong with me. Ah, oh, look at that Castilla. Looks just like Cobralinia spinosa, which is another species that just has photosynthetic stems that it modifies into spines. That uh, evolutionary convergence again. Pretty wonderful thing. Pretty marvelous to uh, to look at, you know. It's like how cacti and euphorbs uh, look almost exactly alike in certain cases, but uh, they're not related at all. Just responding to the same kinds of uh, environmental pressures. What's going on here? So glad I wore pants and not shorts. Just the kind of serious. Here's a nice muffler. Anybody need a muffler? Oh yeah, there you go. We seen you crossing the road earlier, guy. We're not gonna we're not gonna mess with you. I just wanna take some pictures. You got a beautiful shell. Go for us Berlandieri. Berlandieri, whatever whatever how do you pronounce it? I don't know. You don't even give a shit who Berlandier was, do you? I don't. Oh look at that. It the uh, Shell protrusion. If I was more of a herpetologist, I'd know what that's called, but uh, either way. Where are you going? It's, it's getting late. You're kind of stuck. I don't know if you're going to be able to uh, move some grass for you. So. Anyway, so this guy's not feeling it, then, uh, you know, I don't blame him. But uh, regardless, these poor bastards get uh, run over by cars a lot. They just get smashed, you know, by... Uh, irreverent drivers and uh, I, I think they don't even reach sexual maturity that are like 15 years old they can live upwards of, you know 60 I think they can live up to about 60 years he's doing a real good job of hiding and this is a male because he's got that little indentation in the under in the uh, in the underside of his shell over there beautiful animal And I guess that's large for one, too. Anyway, I don't want to bum him out too much, so I'm just going to leave him alone. But there you go. You get the idea. Go for his Berlanderi. Anyway, here's that at a kind of serious Enneacanthus again. And again, I don't think it goes too far north into Texas. I think it's, you know, stays relatively close to the border. Well, that's not I'm full of shit. I just seen it up by Leno, but uh, you know they don't get they don't get much further north than the I-10 corridor. And of course, there's a you know their distribution goes on down into Mexico too. I wonder what's been in these? Maybe Javis, some Javelinas. God, it is so dry, and the air just this wind just feels like standing next to a blow dryer. <laughs> It's not, it's not a refreshing breeze at all. There you go, there's some nice lichen. So even though it is a desert, you do get enough moisture in the air at certain times of the year uh, for there to be lichen growing on the branches of this shit. You can see, uh, you got probably three or four different species of lichen now. You know, and then of course the rains, the rain should be starting in a couple months and everything just lights up, you know. Just like a, a dry sponge just waiting to take on water. It's getting a little dark to film now. Anyway. All right, well, I think that's a... Uh, oh, what is this? What acacia is this? Huh. Anyway, I think that's all I got for you. So, uh, you know, you, you go have a nice evening and uh, fuck yourself. Uh. 
So, uh, I believe this is a Texas banded gecko. And apparently he likes my leg. He's a real tiny little guy.